I'm Rich Hadley. I'm the Vice Chair of West Mercia Police's Independent Advisory Group for the LGB and T communities. I'm going to be talking to Chief Constable David Shaw about hate crime and in particular the kind of work that West Mercia Police is doing to tackle hate behaviour and hate crime in our community. Chief Constable David Shaw, please could you introduce yourself? Yes, Richard. Uh, my name is David Shaw. I'm the Chief Constable of West Mercia Police, so um, I have the privilege and pleasure of leading this force, um, and we're responsible for policing communities across Worcestershire, Her Herefordshire, Shropshire, Telford and the Recon. Very good. First of all, we're here to talk about hate crime. Could you tell us, David, what is hate crime? Yeah, well, there's a long sort of technical definition that the Home Office might use, but for me, it's actually it's actually quite simple. It's any crime that's directed a port towards someone because of um, their own faith, their own gender, um, their sexuality. There's a whole range of technical reasons what it's included. Basically, it's a crime that's about attacking someone for who they are and what they stand for, and that's why it has such a corrosive, terrible effect both upon those individuals and the communities that they're part of. So there is legislation in place uh, that has outlawed hate behaviour? Yes, absolutely, and there's, and there's not only legislation there. Um, we as the police are expected to give it greater priority, and CPS and the courts are. And CPS? It, Crown Prosecution Service, yeah, sorry, who support the police in bringing cases to trial seeing that prosecution through at court and presenting it to the court before a magistrate or, or a judge and a jury. So across the whole of the sort of criminal justice family, there's an acknowledgement about how impactive and how damaging hate crime could be. That's why we're trying to make it even more of a priority than it already is. Very good. So could you tell us what West Mercia Police in particular is doing to tackle hate crime? Yeah, well, I think I think we're sort of tackling it in two, in two broad areas. One is about procedure. But I'll come back to that. I think probably the most important thing is for people like me and senior leaders in the organisation to drive through a cultural shift. Now, we've come on a long, long way since I first became a police officer, when, if, if I'm honest, we probably didn't acknowledge it in the way that we should and, in fact, the way we are now. And every day I see examples of officers and staff really tacking it differently. But we need to get to the point where I'm absolutely confident that when someone rings us or comes through the door, they've been treated and they're a victim of hate crime, they're going to be treated with empathy, with professionalism, with understanding, and that people get it, you know, that we that we understand this goes right to the core of someone. And very often, for someone to come to us, to pluck up the courage to come to us, it won't be the first time or the second time. It could be 10, 20, 30 times before they've literally come to the end of their tether. Now, I, I actually hope we'll come to a point where people feel they'll come to us the first or the second time, you know, that they think, I'm not going to tolerate this, I want help from the police. If they can resolve it themselves amicably, and it doesn't need the police to intervene, fine, but sometimes people do need the police. And one of the measures of success for me is people feel readier to come to us. So there's that big sort of cultural shift and that change in understanding and and, and, and appreciating the, the problems and the challenges of being a victim of hate crime. But of course... It's, it's all good, well and good having those sentiments and, and, and those values and expectations, but you've got to put things around that. So one of the most important things I think we've done uh, recently is, is this year we said it wants to be one of the force priorities, one of the force priorities. Um, it might sound strange, but we're actually looking for an increase in the level of people recording incidents. And the reason I say it's strange is because people think the police always want things to go down. Well, yes, of course, I want the actual number of incidents or hate crimes to go down, but the, the truth is that we think there's vast under-reporting mm. of hate crime, so we would actually rather it went up, which is a sign that people have confidence and faith in us, and that people see this as us as a route to get rid of them, or stop them being victims. Mm. So we're, in, we're making a, a priority. Um, Every single month we review performance, both across the force and locally, to see what's going on. And every single hate crime is given precedence and priority by a senior officer on each of the territories we police to make sure it's been investigated speedily and thoroughly and professionally. Um, it's a long, long journey. It's a long. We've come a hell of a long way, but there's still a lot to do. But uh, um, as chief, as chief constable, you know, I'm I'm both personally and professionally intrinsically um, behind this push, and it's the right thing to do.
Do you have any sense of what lies at the basis of hate behaviour, whether or not it's hate crime or just simply prejudiced, bigoted behaviour? Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, this, that sort of question has been the subject of huge amounts of research, and quite rightly so. Um, I'll give you a personal view. I think a lot of it is based on fear. It's the fear of them. Um, they're not like us and they're not like me. Um, and that sometimes victimising people can give you a sense of power um, over those people. Um, I think within some people there is um, an innate ability to cause harm on those that they perceive as weaker. Um, I don't mean society is intrinsically evil, I, don't, I believe it's intrinsically good, but there are some individuals who will latch onto what they perceive as weakness or people less fortunate themselves. Um, and without saying it's all hopeless, we do have to accept, unfortunately, that sometimes enforcement, sanctions, using the power of the law is the only route. However, I do believe that that policing and enforcement is not the solution. It's a way of stopping some of it and hoping that individual change. I believe fundamentally that we have to look at um, societal change, change in schools. Perhaps we have to look at parenting skills. Um, we're, I'm talking to you here now in the middle of, in the middle of the Olympics, and and you know it might sound a bit cliche, but it hasn't been a fabulous example of how this country can work brilliantly together in spite of our differences. In fact, because of our differences, and the contrast with this time last year is quite extraordinary. It gives me great hope for the future. But um, I sit here as a chief with quite considerable resources at my disposal, but I don't for a minute begin to suggest that policing can solve it all. But we are a big, big part sometimes of putting people's lives back in a better position so to stop them becoming victims, give them the stability and sense of security in their communities. And it's within that, in a safe environment, that we can then really make the, the broader change. Do you think it's possible for perpetrators of hate behaviour or hate crime to actually turn the corner, see the light, if you like? Do you have any experience of that? Of Oh, undoubtedly, I believe it's possible for some. And, and I think things like community resolution or other non um, other criminal justice routes to bring people face to face with the consequences of their actions that can be extraordinarily powerful um, I've actually witnessed people who have done things and when they're told about the impact upon their victims you, you can sense there might be a change in them um, unfortunately sometimes the environment in which they live and work and play might not allow them to make that change as easy as they might want to um, but they need, we need to find ways in which we can support that. That's why I think schools, upbringing, um, can be very can be very helpful. I mean, again, not hopefully naively, but some cause for optimism. We we fortunately live here in a relatively low crime area where community cohesion is very good, and there's lots of people in all sorts of sectors doing great work around this. So although I'm talking now with great passion and and a real commitment to make this change, it's not a statement of me saying it's in a bad place because it's not but as a priority albeit the numbers are small it's absolutely right and proper that we focus very heavily on it so are there any practical things that you are doing at the moment to encourage uh, minority people from minority communities in particular lgb and t yeah. communities to come forward to the police. I, th I think, Richard, there's, just, there's a whole sort of spectrum of things we're doing. Um, in no particular order, just a couple months back, we had a fantastic day where we invited partners and agencies um, and members of all different communities to come and say, how can we do hate crime better? And it wasn't, we hosted it, but it wasn't the police talking to. It Hopefully, and I very much tried to instill this spirit, it was tell us how we can do better. And out of that, it's going to come an action plan. Again, not owned by us, but hopefully shared by everybody. Um, as I've said before, we're making it a priority. So everybody that I lead knows they will be judged, held to account for how we look after victims, how well we investigate, how professional we are. Um, we have introduced a much better system of... No, that sounds very robotic. We're trying to get much better at understanding when people call us what they need, not not jumping into some sort of automatic series of responses you know so in other words if this has happened to you we'll do these 12 things we're getting much much better at saying right then has this happened before um trying to understand what people's individual histories and vulnerabilities are understanding what sort of threat 
there is to them there and then and in the future and tailoring our response much better and that's skillful and difficult work and, and complex work but it's 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 effort and time well invested both by us but also by the people that call us um, a whole range of things we're doing about cultural change making sure that supervisors know we've got to get a grip on this um, and I would say again finally the, the most practical thing is just inculcating in every single one of our officers and staff that these are priority offences and incidents that these people come to us um, at the end of usually a very long and very difficult road and we need to reflect that and, and we are seeing and I'm sure we'll continue to see um, huge improvements. There is one last thing if I could, if I could add this and um, it's just about reaching out to different communities you know on, I can't on the one hand saying come to us when you've got a problem it's much better if we establish a relationship with people or leaders within those communities so there's already a relationship and people can have either third parties come along to support them or for there to be other stories and narratives that come along and saying this is an organisation you can trust. So I think that's a very, finally, that's a very, very practical one. Just getting involved with speaking, meeting with the very communities that we're talking about. So do you think that there are any cultural or perceptual issues within the force itself? We say the force is the police re reflects society mm. in large measure. Mm. So it would be fair to assume, given that we've got discriminatory attitudes out in society as a whole, that they also pertain in the police force itself, not particularly West Mercia police. Yeah. How are you tackling that? Well, I, I, the first thing, I don't necessarily accept part of the premise of your question, that the police force reflects society. Um, Yes, it might do in terms of there are racist people out there and there are people that think domestic violence, for instance, is OK. Therefore, we're going to get our fair share of them. Okay. Um, the reason I don't accept that is because we should be absolutely scrupulous in trying to root those people out in the first case. Mm -hmm. And if we do find them, we get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And I've been very explicit that people who come into the force to damage the public or damage us or our reputation, I'll get rid of them. And I make no bones about that. But of course... It's one thing to say, though, those are fine words. It's then what it means internally. What I am absolutely confident is that we are far, far less tolerant and we go out to confront behaviour that just isn't up to scratch. And I think that generally um, what is allowed... Well, no, no, I'm not, I think. I know that what might have passed as acceptable across a whole range of things a few years ago just isn't acceptable now. And you will have officers and staff actually saying... That just is not acceptable behaviour or not an acceptable way of conducting yourself. Now, as I've said just a few minutes ago, we will get some stuff wrong and we will meet members of the public who will tell us when it's gone wrong and then we need to address that. But people's fears that as an organisation we are intrinsically um, lacking in empathy or understanding victims' needs, I would definitely I would definitely counter that, that proposal. Um, and what I would say is, again... You know, come and meet us, talk to us, get to know individuals, officers, not just as a uniform or a number, but build a relationship with them in your own community. We quite rightly invest as much as we can in local policing so that we don't just come when there's an emergency. We are there sometimes on a nice sunny day walking down the street. It's going to be more difficult, but, you know, we can build relationships. I encourage my local policing teams and sergeants and inspectors to get into the communities in peacetime you know not when not when the incident or the crime has happened but actually when there isn't a crisis that's the way to build those relationships and i think increasingly people will say this is a workforce that we're proud to be part of and people are proud to be pleased by us can you bring it down to some sort of practical things in terms of west mercia are this are the things that you're doing or have been doing which you'd like to celebrate in terms of real success stories really you know inspirational uh, examples mm. of, of of the of the good stuff that's happening out there yeah well i mean the the there are numerous cases of where i could demonstrate that um, we have been received reports of victim uh, of hate crime and dealt with it with great care, great sensitivity, but also for me ultimately very effectively. You know that, that the outcome is critical for me. It's no point making someone feel comfortable and confident that we're going to care for them, but then we don't see it through. And by that, I don't necessarily always mean that we see that through to court. There's lots of ways in which an outcome can be effective. So that's the first thing. And and. I can give you countless examples. I think 
that it's really, really um, encouraging that people are writing to us and saying, I was a victim or my family, someone in my family was, and you dealt with them, whether it's with learning difficulties or because of the colour of their skin or whatever, and you dealt with them with great care. And some of them are written almost affectionately. You know, people are sometimes bowled over by us exceeding expectations about how we would deal with them. So there's those examples. For me, at even perhaps even more encouragingly, is just the sense of this very big ship that is West Mercia is taking a real change of direction. And it's not down to people like me, it's down to lots of people like me and my predecessors and the people that come after me to change perceptions, bring our values uh, into line with the ones I've described and, and really see hate crime for what it is, which is amongst the most vindictive and vicious types of crimes there can be because of its motivation. Um, so I think that the, the sense of, my sense of the experience that we are going through as, as a service and the experience that the public are receiving because of us, I, I, I'm abs I fundamentally believe has taken a profound change in the last few years and as long as I'm anything to do with it, we'll continue to. Well, thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you very much, Richard.